So I, I, was, I was asked to talk about um, data publication specifically and, and very much how the Managing Research Data Program is, is seeking to encourage that, um, among other things. I'll start off with a tragic tale of, of woe which may make your, your lunches sit un, uncomfortably in your stomach. Who knows about this affair? Do you, do you know who this, this chap, this smiley fellow, Diedrich Stapel is? Is that, is that a good show of hands? A, a, a few of you, you. Diedrich Stapel was as, well, it, um, is in a sense, but um, he, he was a very well-known uh, social psychologist at the University of Tilburg in the Netherlands, um, who, it was, it was found recently, had f essentially fabricated all the research data that underpinned his research outputs for some considerable le length of time. I forget exactly, but it's, you know, in the order of, uh, of near on to a couple of decades. Not just his own research outputs, but those of his research students as well. Um, not, I hasten to ask, with their connivance. Um, he was able to do this because he was very much regarded in the department as the king of the data. It was he that looked after the data that underpinned the research outputs, and he provided data from a set of sources which uh, he kept very close to his chest, and it turned out they were entirely in his imagination. Um, the internal study that Tilburg University has done into this affair makes extremely interesting reading um, in a number of uh, for a number of reasons about academic culture in general in, in, in this particular department and the, the, the seniority, the, the impact that seniority can, can have. But most importantly for, for today's uh, discussion and thoughts, the lack of a culture of data sharing which fundamentally allowed this fraud, because that's what it was, this fraud to go on for so many years. Um, so the, re the internal report and the interim report, I should stress, um, identified what they called a lamentable element of the culture in social psychology and psychology research for everyone to keep their own data and not to make them available to a public archive. And they recommended that research data that underlies psychology publications must be held on file for at least five years after publication and be made available on request to other scientific pra pra uh, practitioners. And any publication drawing on a, a set of data, as almost all academic research publications do in one form or another, should state where the raw data reside and how to access them. So this is one reason, one important reason for making research data openly available is verification, understanding that the research that has been, the research that has been conducted is sound. And we need not imagine that the research that goes on is fraudulent, as was in case of the Stapel case, but at least checking the methodology, understanding that this is, these are good, strong research findings. This is part of research. This is, this is essential to research, and therefore the open availability of research data is essential to research. There are other good reasons for sharing research data. These, this is a, a graph from the Hubble Space Telescope showing the reuse of research data for reasons other than its original purpose. So the, the blue section at the bottom is res uh, research outputs, articles, written on the basis of original observations. So the way the Space Telescope functions is that researchers, research groups, submit an application for data to be gathered. And with that application, they submit the reasons, what sort of research project this is. And research outputs for those purposes are, are the blue. Above that, the, sorry, so the, the data that's gathered is then archived and can, after a, a, an embargo period, be accessed and reused, and different questions asked of it. And these are the, in the, in the, um, in the, in the red, um, at least, and uh, a, mixed, a mixed band as well. Those are, those are the outputs from reuse with different questions asked. And they now outstrip the original use asking new questions of, of, of the research, an important reason for sharing research data. Um, another reason is for the integration of research data from disparate sources for, to, and to ask particular research questions in multidisciplinary studies. So this, is, uh, point, this point is made in the recent RIN report, 
on information practices in the physical sciences, um, where particularly in the areas of earth science and nanoscience, they observed that new technologies for sharing data and combining data from disparate sources are particularly valuable. And the challenge is now, now faces us to federate and to mine, to analyze and interpret these data. And th this will be a key challenge in the, in the years to come. So that's integrating data from disparate sources. And then finally, another use case of important for research, uh, making research data available for reuse um, are meta-studies. Putting together the findings from separate small studies, integrating those results, analyzing that data, makes the findings more solid. And there's an increasing, uh, increasingly strong literature calling um, for data availability for these purposes now. So, good data management is good for research. If you look after your data well during the project life cycle, um, this can, we believe, and we have some evidence to show that it can lead to a more efficient research process and the avoidance of data loss. But data sharing, data publication is good for research as well, for the reasons I've sta stated. Verification, the benefits of reuse, asking new questions, um, meta-studies, and the integration of disparate research. So these observations are not terribly original. They have, made, uh, they have been made by research funders um, who over the last few years have emitted re policies requiring, encouraging researchers to make the outputs of publicly funded research available, and including the research data. And this move towards making research data open should align with university missions as well. If universities are, aspire to be an excellent environment for the conduct of, of world-class research, then that also requires an excellent research data infrastructure for research data to be looked after properly and made available for reuse. I think it's worth very briefly just spending some time to look at the sort of principles that have been put together by research funders on the one hand and, and increasingly by institutions that are developing research data policies, including the um, University of Edinburgh. So, already been set, stated, same principles for open access to uh, written scholarly outputs or other scholarly outputs. Publicly funded research data are a public good, produced in the public interest. You know, it, it's worth banging bang on this and recognizing that it applies to the data as well as the article. Data with acknowledged long-term value should be preserved and remain accessible for reuse because of the cases I've, I've suggested. And also that data sharing can increase the impact of research. So take the Hubble Space T Telescope. Impact would be halved if they, limit, if they didn't share the data and allow it to be, to be reused for purposes other than the original uh, data gathering. From the University of Edinburgh uh, Research Data Management Policy, Research data of future historical interest and all research data that represent records of the university, including data that substantiate research findings, should be deposited, either with the university or with an appropriate discipline-focused data repository. And, as has already been mentioned in the case of the Starple affair, published results should always include information on how to access the supporting data. It's just good practice. Now getting on to the more challenging areas. <clears throat> it's fundamentally important to encourage researchers and, and institutions, anyone to invest funds in making research data available, that this effort be properly recognized, particularly the effort and the intellectual investment of the researchers that gathered the, the research data uh, originally. And research funders recognize it. All users of research data should acknowledge the sources of their data and abide by the terms and conditions on which they're accessed. And we also need to recognize that not all research data can be openly shared. There are legal, ethical, and sometimes commercial reasons for not doing so. I don't, don't think those, those need to be spelled out now. Universities are increasingly having to, uh, to play uh, a prominent role in this, These, as well as uh, putting out a, a set of principles on research data, the EPSRC have put out some expectations and a roadmap, or the, require a roadmap of institutions for compliance 
with these expectations by the 1st of May 2015. And if anyone wants to talk in more detail about these uh, uh, data policy expectations, Ben Ryan from the EPSRC is, 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 is with us today, so I'm sure he'd be keen to, to field any questions. In particular, in these expectations, um, there's a requirement of, or the expectation on research organi organizations to maintain a public catalog of research data holdings, including adequate metadata and a permanent identifier. This has been discussed in the, in the case of institutional repositories. This will be a challenge, but it's necessary if the research data is to be discoverable and to be reusable. And again, I think for the third time, publications should indicate how the research data can be accessed. It's not just research funders and research institutions that are making these observations and producing policies to this effect. Research, uh, journals are doing so increasingly. This is a particularly interesting example um, of, of such journal policies on data archiving and data availability, which was put together by a consortium, if you like, of journals in the area of evolutionary biology and ecology, and underpins an initi a US initiative called the Dryer Data Repository. So the joint data archiving uh, policy, the, the boards, the journal editorial boards, got together and put together this policy, which first recommended, and then after a year's grace, required that any, any article submitted to the participating journals, the data substantiating that article should be deposited with the Dryad data repository if there weren't another repository which, which were more suited. I, I've expressed that awfully, but you, you know what I'm trying to say. This journal requires, as a condition of publication, the data supported, supporting the results in the paper should be archived in appropriate public archive, such as GenBank, TreeBase, or Dryad, or the network, uh, knowledge network of biocomplexity. And Dryad is a data archive for disparate data that doesn't necessarily fit into the more specialized data archives like GenBank, etc. I said that journals and journal editorial boards are increasingly developing these policies. In the last year, under a year still, nine months, um, 20 titles from Biomed Central have adopted data availability policies. Um, 16 of which are uh, fall into the category of encouraging and four require. So we have policies from funders and from institutions and from journals and that this raises a lot of challenges and questions for, for how, how do we turn these policies into, into reality. What research data should be kept and, and for how long, how do we select it? Well, to some extent that relates to the, the, pur the purposes and the objectives which, which have been mentioned, the verification and reuse, that, allows some, that provides some form of methodology to identify what research data is likely to be of value. But then, then again, a lot of research data substantiates the findings which are in research articles. So we're probably talking about quite a lot of the data which is, which is generated. How do we best support the good management and the publication of research data? Well, lots of things are required. I'll go into that briefly. Where should the data be archived? Well, there, are, there is a network of international and national discipline-focused data centers, but it's unlikely that they will cover all research areas. And I think it's increasingly recognized that institutions, the universities, as knowledge as knowledge enterprises, I suppose, are going to have to perform a lot of this, this work. How do we ensure discoverability? I'm not going to go into that now, but it's, you know, as was mentioned this morning with institutional uh, repositories and with um, green open access, it's an important challenge. But what I'm going to focus on for the, for the rest of the talk is um, where this requir requires a change of practice, which in most research disciplines it does. How do we motivate researchers to make data available in a usable form? And that's going to be a significant challenge. So as I've said, there's lots of practical uh, barriers, the lack of infrastructure, the lack of support or expertise, whether that's with the researchers themselves or the support staff in universities, and there are significant technical challenges as well. But in a sense, all these are, are relatively tra tractable. Um, we do have to pay attention to the, 
what you might categorize as behavioral challenges, uh, um, barriers rather. Researchers' reluctance to share data, the concern that their research data may be misused, that they'll lose scientific edge, and above all, that they'll not be credited, and the lack of career war, uh, relative career rewards for making research data available. Everything pins on article impact values, etc., not on the reuse and the creation of well-crafted metadata and reusable research data. Um, so I think, I think it's not unfair to, to, to characterize the researchers' concerns in, uh, as, as three things. Firstly, um, recognition. Secondly, recognition. And thirdly, <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> so fundamental to recognition for publishing research data is the integration of research data with the scholarly, um, with the scholarly uh, communications process. And that's really what I'll talk about. Before I get quite onto that, though, um, I'll just mention the way that we're trying to sort of support other aspects of this in the managing research data. So we like uh, managing research data program. We like to look at the research data life cycle and analyze at le each of these stages. How does an institution, a research group, or an individual researcher need to be supported so that the research data that they create can be adequately reused at the end of that um, life cycle. And that requires support for storage, for annotation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go into chapter and verse here. A lot of the activity in the Managing Research Data Program focuses on the, on the, so the early part of the life cycle, equipping institutions to look after the research data better so that it can be made available for reuse. However, it would be negligent of us not to pay some attention to the publication of research data and how research data can be best accessed and uh, discovered and, and accessed. Analysis of that life cycle led us to divide the, the, the program into five objectives. This, this isn't necessarily strands of activity or individual projects. Many of the projects target a number of these particular objectives. It's the way of communicating and expressing what, what the key elements of, are required if, if you to manage research data better. So we encourage institutions and, and projects to develop leaderships and to develop research data management policies. So 17 projects uh, funded by the Managing Research Data Program will be producing, are producing uh, data management policies for their institution. Um, guidance and training materials both reference materials and specific training materials for researchers in particular disciplines or for librarians or research staff are being produced as well. There's also a lot of support for data management planning. Uh, preparing a sound data management plan is, is viewed as good practice in the management of research data and as an important way of inculcating uh, good practice and spreading it further. And of course, um, most of the projects are developing research data management systems and infrastructure for storage or for the better management of research data during the lifetime of the project. However, we have paid some attention, small amount of attention, because it's a harder area to work in, I think, into the publication, citation, and discovery uh, mechanisms, which are essential, both if research data is to, is to be effectively reused and if the reward and recognition aspects which will motivate researchers to share their research data um, are to be addressed. So in the first managing research data program which ended in 2011, the, a small set of projects were funded which looked at um, some of the challenges around citing research data and linking research data to publications or to other digital objects. Um, and those projects are summarized neatly and briefly um, in the Digital Curation Center's um, briefing paper, which is the bottom, bottom paper there. Um, and there's also a more detailed how-to guide with recommendations about the citing and linking of research data, which the Digital Curation Center has produced. Also in the first program, we funded a, um, a project called the Dryad UK project, which worked with the aforementioned um, Data Dryad uh, repository, and worked to expand the number of journals which were participating in the joint archiving, data archiving policy. Um, and now, the, uh, so Partners in Dryad now includes BMJ Open and a no lo number of titles from PLOS and from Biomed Central. And the project also prepared a business model for the long-term funding of the data repository. 
And one of the possible payment uh, models for the dry data repository, I think, is very interesting. Because there's this chain of payments, potentially, from the research funder to the project via a gold open access fee to the journal and then to the repository. And the cost of data archiving for a long time, not necessarily in perpetuity, let's not be that ambitious, but for as long as any of us need worry about for the, with the data uh, dried repository, is not particularly significant. The first estimates ranged between $25 and $75 per publication. We are talking about not particularly large data, it's mostly spreadsheets or small databases, but nevertheless. When you compare that to the price, of the, uh, the estimated price, not just the gold open access fee, but the estimated price produced per open access article, um, that estimation from, from those sources was two and a half uh, thousand US dollars. I don't, I, I suspect that there, there might be some variation in, in estimates. Nevertheless, I think the point, the point is accepted that data archiving of that sort is not particularly expensive. So um, Dried UK produced a new funding model or recommendations for a funding model which were adopted in May 2012 by the Dried uh, Consortium. And there's a number of ways in which, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but there's a number of ways in which long-term uh, data archiving can be paid for um, through, through the Dryad model. And the figures there are not, are not particularly high per article or per data relating to a given article. Dried UK also developed a new governance model. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but just for, you know, just for the record, those recommendations were made to the Dryer Consortium and were also adopted in May 2012. So there's an increasing interest in <clears throat> data publication and particularly linking research data to journal articles in various ways. This um, pyramid of data publications sort of does the rounds quite, quite a lot recently. It is really an attempt to survey the landscape rather than anything else. Um, the top segment of the, of the, of the pyramid really is, is what goes on at the, at the moment. It's the expression of data within a research data, within a, a, a scholarly article. So that might be a table or a graph. And increasingly you're getting more complex and interesting and, and you know, integrated ways of, of, of accessing the data in this way. But really that's sort of very much you know, as is. Um, then, then there's also data included in the supplementary material associated with a journal article in the, in the second band. And increasingly, and hence the pyramid, larger quantities of data, well looked after, well described, curated in disciplinary specific data archives and, and structured data databases which are accessible on the, on the internet. And those can be linked to the, the scholarly article. But then, of course, at the bottom of the pyramid, this vast mass of unstructured, ill-described data, which is effectively unused and lost in people's drawers or external hard drives and the, uh, the famous data center under the desk. Now, where we're going increasingly, um, I, I, I should have said this pyramid is is, is from the ODE report. I think it's been used before in presentations by Yvka Schmidt, but it, it appears in the ODE report on the integration of data and publications, and it's, it's a very useful survey of, of the landscape of, of publication data. But I think where we're going is certainly moving away from the raw data sets and integrating them in one way or another with journal articles, accessible through a link of some sort or more directly integrated with, with the journal article. And if we're not moving away from the sort of the, the expression of research data within the journal article, we're moving into more interesting and exciting ways of, of expressing that, expressing visualizations within the journal article. I think someone's already said that the, the scholarly article will look a lot different in a few years' time than it does now. So also from the ODE report, or the ODE report, there's a sort of a plea, if you like, for integration of data and publications. They urge that um, doing so helps data be better discoverable and better interpretable by close linking to an article which describes the data and expresses some form of uh, conclusion or finding on the result of that data, and above all, provides the author with better credit for making the data available. 
And conversely and e extremely importantly, integrating or making data accessible through a journal article adds depth and richness to that, to that article and, after all, allows the findings to be tested. Associated with the ODE research, uh, the Pars Insight uh, survey found that 85% of researchers are in favour of linking um, research data with the literature in this way, so it ought to be a no-brainer. But once again, I think we find often that researchers are keen to access other people's data and less keen to share their own. Nevertheless, I think, as with open access, there is a clear sense of movement in this area and an increasing recognition in various quarters that research data sh ought to be recognised and increasingly are being recognised as a first-class research object, which means that they research data require preservation, recognition, validation and dissemination, just like research articles. So there's a number of initiatives doing work in this area. I mentioned just two, but there, there are far more. Uh, BMC Research Notes, which encourage publication of code, as well as the research data underpinning articles. And also the Earth System Science Data uh, Journal. And I, I use this because I, I like this strap line, because I think it, it expresses very well what we're trying to encourage and where things are moving. So the Earth System Science Data Journal aims to publish data according to the conventional fashion of publishing articles, applying established principles of quality assessment through peer review. So it's a journal which encourages the peer review of the data as well as the interpretive articles describing the data and drawing conclusions from the data. These are initiatives and activities which we're seeking to encourage directly through the GIST Managing Research Data Programme. So I'll end the presentation with two uh, projects which were selected through the recent call of call for, uh, for, for projects and which uh, will start imminently either later this month or on the 1st of July. Both of which are looking at some of the challenges involved in making research data directly available and easily accessible through journal <coughs> articles and the exchange of information and, uh, which is required to do that. So the first is led by UCL with partnership with uh, Ubiquity Press and the Archaeological uh, Data Service and we'll be looking essentially at uh, metadata exchange between those three partners, between the UCL Discovery uh, ePrints repository, which will be look, potentially looking after open access articles as well as the research data, the Archaeological Data Service, of course, which looks after archaeology research data, and the Journal of Open Archaeology Data, which is an initiative of the Ubi uh, of Ubiquity Press. And as many of these things, it builds on, um, on previous DRISS projects, including Dryad UK um, Reward, which involved uh, Ubiquity Press um, training uh, archaeologists in research data management, and uh, the Sword Arm project, which is using the Sword protocol for deposit of research data to the Archaeology Data Service. I'll just run through their use cases very quickly, because I think, given what was said this earlier, these, these may be of interest. So, the first UK use case is that a UCL researcher deposits data with ADS and the metadata is exchanged with the UCL repository because it's increasingly good practice for the data repository of the institution also to have a record of the research data and where it sits, even if it sits in an external data repository. Because, after all, this was research conducted at UCL by UCL researchers. The other use case is the opposite of that, is depositing the research data for whatever reason, perhaps for the integrity of a particular collection with UCL, but also making sure that ADS have the record of the research data. And then finally, the journal is involved as well. So the article is submitted to the journal for peer review. The data is, um, and if the journal in question has as a condition of publication that the data should be posit deposited some somewhere, then this workflow has to be set up where the data is deposited in the institutional repository and the various partners are informed that this has been done, the metadata is shared, etc., etc. The second project, um, which, which uh, will start on the 1st of, of July, um, is prepared which, um, again, is looking at a number of the aspects of the 
workflow involved in data publication and the relationships between journals, data archives, institutional repositories, etc. Et um, the lead on this project is Jonathan Tetz, who's hiding at the back of the room. Um, so if you want any further information, um, please speak to him. There's a host of, of partners, national and international. A principal source of the case studies will be the Geoscience Data Journal, which is a new initiative from Wiley Blackwell. It's an open access journal encouraging the publication of research data. It so happens that it builds upon previous activities, research and mechanisms, which was conducted in a gist funded project, the OGIMS project, the Overlay Journal Infrastructure for Meteorological Sciences project. And they'll be using that particular journal as one of their case studies, but work, as I said, working with international partners. So again, it's looking at the workflows involved in data deposit and article deposit, and paying particular attention to a number of areas which require further analysis and insight and, and recommendations. So that includes author guidelines for, for data papers and submissions, the accreditation of repositories. Some of the data will be deposited with BADC, which is a national data repository. Other data may be de deposited with institutional repositories. And how does an institutional repository show that it looks after the data to a sufficiently robust, um, in a sufficiently robust fashion? So the scientific review of, of data, how is that best conducted? What are the most appropriate linking mechanisms and mechanisms for metadata exchange? And what are the division of responsibility in this process, in this partnership process between the various, various stakeholders? OK, I'm nearly done. So these solutions will be tested with the partners and three workshops run in, the, in early 2013. And recommendations from this test and from the uh, study with the partners will be uh, made to the broader community. There's information on their objectives and the roles and responsibilities of the various partners, which may be of interest. So final point, um, I hope I've mentioned earlier in the presentation that there are an increasing number of um, journals which have produced uh, data availability policies. It would be a good thing if researchers, research support staff, librarians, etc., could have easy access to the content of those, of those uh, policies and were able better, therefore, to advise researchers or researchers themselves to know what the policies were and what the requirements of them were. It's not entirely dissimilar to the sort of um, registry uh, and the sort of service that the Sherpa Romeo uh, project provides. So we hope that there's some sort of there's some uh, arrangements to be made with that, with that project, but we hope to be able to announce shortly a feasibility study and analysis of business models for precisely such a registry, which will go forward as a just project in the near future, to pull together uh, what's required for a, journal, uh, a registry of journal of data availability and sharing policies. Thanks very much for your time. Um, Thank you.